my microphone may kind of sound strange. I think during that last song we were singing, I was banging my chest or something. I like scrunched it up and I looked at it and that doesn't even look like what it looks like normally. So, um, so hopefully that it'll work okay. Uh, let's get started. Um, in case you weren't here last week, I'd love to give you a recap. I believe if it's worth talking about one week, it's worth reminding you about the next week. And so last week we jumped into the book of Galatians. We started in chapter 3, not 1, but chapter 3, and there was a reason for that. And so, as we started in chapter 3, we saw that Paul started out by uh, talking to the Galatians, and he said, uh, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? And I tried to explain to you why he would start off like that, why he would say something like that. Is what happened was, is Paul went into this, to this region, that, or this area, and he was preaching the gospel to them. He was teaching the good news about grace through faith. And they received it from him, and then when, they, when he left, they remained there, and some deceivers came in. And they started to preach a different gospel to these people. And they were in danger of turning away from the, the gospel that Paul had preached. Now, I'm not saying that they were turning away from Jesus, but they were starting to follow some other, other things and adding to the gospel that Paul had preached. What they had told them was, is that it couldn't be as simple as believing it couldn't be as simple as believing. There had to be another part, and that part was our role, and it was to follow the law. And Paul was like, you foolish people for believing that. And so he tried his best to explain to them that uh, grace through faith had been around for a long time. And so he talked about Abraham. They knew about Abraham. They knew who he was. And so he said that uh, the gospel was revealed in advance to Abraham. I know that's kind of confusing, but we talked about it last week where... Uh, Abraham believed God, and so it was credited to him as righteousness. Now remember, we are not righteous on our own. We're not in right standing. We're not justified. There's nothing we can do to do that for ourselves. But through the blood of Christ, he imputes his righteousness to us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And so the gospel was revealed in advance to Abraham because he was found righteous because he believed. And so Paul would continue to talk to the people about Abraham. He went into the covenant a little bit. And then I took you back to Genesis chapter 15. And hopefully you guys that were here remember this. Because to me it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. And so in chapter 15, Abraham's talking back and forth with God. God had made some promises to Abraham. Abraham's kind of struggling, uh, seeing these things come true. He doesn't have a son to uh, get his inheritance. He's thinking that maybe a servant will receive that. God said that's not going to happen. Not going to happen. I'm going to give you a son. Tells him these things are going to come true. Abraham believes him. That's where he's accredited as righteousness. But right after that, God tells him he'll take possession of a certain land. And Abraham's like, well, how will I know for sure that I'll take possession of that land? And so God tells him some specific instructions. He says, go get some animals. We're going to kill those. He kills them. He cuts them in half. And I tried to explain it to you last week is you would take half the animal and place it here, 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 create a pathway. Because back in these days, to seal a covenant, they would have these sacrifices that would line a pathway, and then each party would get on opposite ends, they would walk down the path, they would meet in the middle, there would be this strange collapsing of wrists, not sure what that's all about. They would do that, and that would seal a covenant. And so God tells Abraham to get these animals, sacrifice them, and lay it out. He's probably thinking he's about to do something special with God. He's about to seal this covenant. But it doesn't happen that way. What happens is, is God puts Abraham to sleep. And so Abraham's just snoozing over there. God speaks over his life, tells him what's going to happen. And then God walks the path. Now God is, doesn't stop halfway going, man, I hope he wakes up. He doesn't do that. He's not like nervous that Abraham's not going to get up and come do the deal with him. But no. Instead, God walks the whole path to seal the deal, saying, I got it. And what I want you to see last week was, is God made a covenant, an agreement, with the equivalent of a dead man. Abraham had no part in it. I want you to see that this deal that we talk about with grace, it is no partnership. If it was a partnership, that means we would have to repay part of it. And grace is a gift, and if you have to repay a gift, that's not a gift that's a loan. We have no part in grace, grace through faith, except for faith. God did the work on the cross. We just believe. We just believe. And that's what Paul was trying to get across to, to the Galatians. And what we'll talk about today is going to be sound very redundant, 
But when you hear things that are redundant in the gospel and in the word of God, it's because it's important. And so we're going to go into chapter 1 in just a minute. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. And thank you for our moms that are here today and just to be able to, to love on them. And Lord, thank you for putting them in our lives. And thank you for allowing us to just worship you this morning. What an amazing time that was. And Lord, just be with us as we study your word. We love you and praise you. Amen. Well, as I was preparing uh, this week, uh, I was thinking about chapter 1, which is where we're going to be. And you can go ahead and turn there, by the way. Um, and as I was thinking about chapter 1, uh, thinking about the gospel and how people were trying to add things to it or make something similar to it, and I thought about all the replications that are out there in life or imitations I think about like if you see somebody wearing Oakley sunglasses, they might not be Oakley. Uh, they, you might see a Gucci bag, it may not be Gucci. <laughs> and so uh, there's all these imitations in life. And for the most part, you know, some of us are okay with that. I mean, we might get that fake Gucci bag and walk around with it. Let me tell you, you don't want a fake gospel. You don't want any imitation. There's only one gospel, and it's about Jesus. Let's talk about it. We're in Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read to you a lot today, so stick with me. Uh, chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Remember, this is not to one church. Many of Paul's letters are to one church. This is to a region, an area where a number of churches are. The other thing I want you to see is, is Paul is trying to establish right away that what he gave them what he received was not of man this was of God that he was preaching to them because they've had other men go in and deceive them and so he's trying to establish some credibility in verse 3 it says grace and peace to you from God our Father the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, as we get to the next part, my Bible says at the top of it, no other gospel. And my wife always reminds me, not everybody says that, but mine does. It says no other gospel. And that's, that's where I kind of think of, there is no imitation. Let's go there. It says, in verse 6, it says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now remember last week we started out with uh, you foolish Galatians who bewitched you. Now he, at the begin here, beginning here in, in chapter 1, he says, I'm astonished at how quickly you turned away from this. And I can see why that would be the case. If you received the greatest gift in the history of mankind called grace, and all of a sudden you receive this grace and somebody comes in and tells you a few things and now you're following the law again, it would be astonishing that you would turn away from that grace so quickly. And so Paul is going to do his best to establish some things with these people today, especially when it comes to the gospel. It says, uh, let's go back here. It says, the one who called you to live in, in grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. It says, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach, to, preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the, what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. Last week, I said the word gospel a number of times. I already said it a number of times this week. And so I want to make sure that we're on the same page. When you hear that word, you understand what I'm talking about. When I talk about gospel, our translation is, is the good news. And I think about the good news being this, is that because of my sin, I deserved hell. But for God so loved the world, He gave His only Son on a cross for us, where His blood was shed, covered our sins. And if we entrust our life to Him and the work on the cross, then one day we will stand before him blameless. And not because of anything we ever did, but because of what he did on our behalf. I don't know about you, but to me, and that's amazing news. That's amazing news. That is the gospel. And if you go to Mark 1.1, it tells you 
what the gospel is about. It says, in the beginning of the gospel about Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus. It's about what he did. It's about what he delivered us from. That's what the gospel is about. I want to talk to you a little bit more about it. I've given this example before, but it's one of my favorites. The Greek word for gospel is euangelion. I'm not only the Greek and Hebrew and stuff. I know a few words, and that's one of them. It's called euangelion. And I want to tell you where that comes from. And maybe it'll make a difference in your walk today. You see, back in those days, they would build cities and they would fortify them. They would put walls around them. They try to protect themselves from invaders. Then what they would do is they would periodically place watchtowers around the walls so they could see out. They could also see in to see, make sure everything's going okay, but they could see out as well to make sure nobody was coming to attack them. And so they would place somebody up there, and if they saw somebody coming to attack their town or their city, they would alert the people. And the army would get together, and they would rush out, and they would fight. They would battle. And so if they were victorious, what would happen was is they would send back a messenger. And that messenger would deliver the euangelion, the gospel, to these people. And they would come back and tell them that the good news was that they won, that they were victorious, and they'd probably get together a celebration and stuff for the guys coming back from the battle. And what I want you to see is when the people thought about the gospel, the euangelion, what their mindset was, was this, proclamation of victory. Proclamation of victory. I want you to know we should have that too. We have a proclamation of victory through the gospel about Jesus. And we should have a, a little hop in our step that's saying, man, I am victorious through Christ. It ought to make a difference in the way we live. And the way, the way we even walk, it should make a difference. But I kind of think that we sometimes may lose the awe of what he's done for us. Let me tell you this little example that I came across this week. I was out about doing my day job and I'm around town a lot, and sometimes when I'm driving around town, I get hungry, and so I had to get a snack. And uh, so I wanted a healthy snack, and so I went and got a fried pie from Pakistan, <laughs> right? That's a good one, right? It's, it's healthy, I think. It's delicious. It's got fruit in it. Uh, so uh, I go into Pakistan, I get my fried pie, not feeling guilty at all, and I uh, started to snack on that for a second before I was going to my next appointment. And I look back at, into the, the store at Pakistan, and uh, there was a TV on, you know, the new stores, they have TVs in them. And so I think they had it on ESPN, and they had uh, a soccer highlight on there. And this guy just, like, scored a goal, and then he runs off, and he slides on his knees, and then he, like, tears off his shirt. It's like, man, that's awesome. I love that, right? I love that. I just love the passion behind it and everything. And I'm sitting there going, man, how come we don't do that in other things? How come we don't get so excited about things? We're, like, tearing off clothes. I mean, not really, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How come, how come they get so much more excited whenever they're, they score a goal than we do in other things in life? And I was just sitting there kind of evaluating all that because that's what I do. And, and I think, you know, they don't do it in basketball. They don't do it in basketball. I played basketball for years. I never ripped off my shirt. I never did. I never did. It would be, I think it would be kind of weird if Kevin Durant goes up for a layup and then he's like, boom, and just throws it off. I just don't, I think it would be weird. Probably get a technical, probably wouldn't go over very well. But I was thinking, you know, why is that the case? Why does it happen that way? And it just hit me why. And I think this, you'll probably get this. It's because if you've ever watched soccer, they never score. <laughs> they never score. I mean, the whole game's long. I mean, it's real long. It's like three to two. I mean, one to zero. And you're like, come on, please, somebody kick the ball in the net. Come on. And so if somebody does, guess what they do? They slide on their knees and tear up their shirt. I mean, they're excited. Somebody finally scored, right? It's a rarity. And so in basketball, it's like, man, people would be ripping clothes off all left and right because they're scoring a ton. <laughs> it's not rare. It's not rare for somebody to score. It's not in basketball. But in soccer, it is. You see, I don't think it ever gets old for them. I don't think it ever does. I think they could score every day and win that game 2-1 to one and, and still be excited about that goal they scored. You see, I think many times with us what happens is we get so used to what we have, we almost take it for granted. We're not as excited as we once were about it. My, my little boy's here just like laying down. He's like, so I'll, t I'll tell you a little story about him. I can go get Bentley 
a little toy, like a little uh, Infinity, uh, Disney Infinity character that he plays on his games. And he can be so excited, like he'll beg, he'll do chores, he'll do everything to go get this. Within about an hour after he gets it, he's done, he's bored. <laughs> I mean, we, we kind of lose track of what was exciting us pretty quickly. And I think it's happened to us many times with our walk. It has. I, I remember whenever uh, I first had this encounter with God, and, and I, I mean, I was just on fire for God, and people could see a difference in my walk, and I'd walk around, and, and I was just, just telling everybody about Jesus, and people could see it in me. They could, and, and, and I see that in, in, in people, too, uh, when that happens. But many times what happens is, is we kind of get up every morning, and the next morning we still are saved by grace, and the next morning we're still saved by grace, and eventually sometimes we don't even think about what's been done for us. I remember as God was doing that in my life when uh, I mean it was just I was just on fire and I was talking to a, a group of people it was a small group at my house and man those poor people uh, I, I, I did a little jump I told them I said hey um, if you won the lottery tomorrow how would you respond and I said I'll tell you how I'd respond I'd be like yeah, yeah it'd be great right <laughs> but you know what every day we wake up we've hit something infinitely greater than the lottery and yet many times don't even acknowledge it. I just say that to you to challenge you. And I want you to know that we're, we'll talk about the gospel on a regular basis. It never gets old. It never gets old. The good news about Jesus, it's always relevant. It's always good. It's always what saves us. And so uh, I just can't say it enough. The good news is great. Let me continue. Verse 10, he says, and I now, that's not what he says. He says, am I now trying to win approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? He says, if I were uh, still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, Paul is setting up where he's fixing to go here in the second part of chapter 1. What he's doing is he's about to give his personal experience with grace. And so he sets it up and he says this right here, that if he was trying to please people, he wouldn't be doing what he was doing. Because there's a lot of people angry with him. There's a lot of people trying to take his life. And so let's go into verse 11 and talk a little bit about Paul's experience with grace. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. It says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. In case you don't know the story, Paul was a big-time persecutor of the church. And he had gone to his authorities and gotten paperwork to go to Damascus and pull out some Christians to take them back to persecute them. Now on the road to Damascus, he's going to have an encounter with God. Uh, uh, this light will blind him. He will go and wait in town for Ananias to come pray over him. After that happens, he goes and gets baptized. And man, he is uh, such a tremendous man of faith. Such a tremendous man of faith. But what I want you to see right here is the statement that, that Paul makes next is absolutely beautiful and life-defining. He, he talks about what he was before. He was zealous for destroying the church. But then he says three words. He says, but when God. But when God. Let me tell you a story. Before I was following Jesus, I listened to somebody else a lot, and his name was Dr. Bill. I did. <laughs> And occasionally still, I bring up some of these Dr. Phil sayings, but I have a little twist on them. And uh, if there's some people in this room who have heard me say this saying to them even recently, and I use it a lot uh, because I believe it. And that is this. The best predictor of the future is the past. The best predictor of the future is the past. And so maybe you can look at your life and go, yeah, yeah, that's probably true. You see, if you want to have a good prediction of what you're going to do next week, look and see what you did last week. I mean, this is good stuff. It's real. 
And so if you came to me and you said, hey, man, I'm going to lay out my routines, patterns, where I frequent, where I go, who I hang out with. I'll lay it all out and kind of see what I did here. And we can kind of predict what you're going to do there. Does that make sense? But there's something that changes that. It's when God shows up. When God shows up in your life, when he's a center of your life, when he's a center of your marriage, when he's a center of what you're doing, it changes everything. You may not go the same places. You may not respond the same. It changes everything in your life. In fact, I bet there's people in this room right now that can testify to that. Maybe you're like, hey, man, I, uh, man, I struggled with alcohol for most of my life, but when God... I struggled with pornography for most of my life or from here and there, but when God. I've been struggling in my marriage. I've been struggling big time, but when God. Are you tracking with me? You want to change your circumstances, bring God into it. He'll change your circumstances. He will. That's good stuff. That's not Dr. Phil. That's from the Word of God. It says, but when God. Because Paul was on a bad road. He was on a bad road persecuting the church, but he says, But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I love that and almost want to laugh saying it. What he's saying was, is when, when, when God called him to preach the good news about Jesus, the grace through faith, and he, when he had that calling on his life, he didn't go get a committee to talk to. He didn't go, hey, let me get a few of my buddies and go, what do you think? He didn't do that. He, he wasn't trying to see, hey, do I have everybody's agreement on this deal? Y'all feel like I can do it? You think I'm good enough? You think this will work out? No, no, he didn't ask anybody. It's like, man, I run past nobody. And the reason why is because God had called him to. You see, I'm all about getting good godly counsel. But if God's telling you to do something, you do it, no matter what a man says. And so he didn't seek anybody because God had called him to share the good news about Jesus. And so that's what he did. Let me continue. He says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, which is Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. He is trying to make sure the people understand he's telling you the truth. The gospel that he preached was, was the word of God. And then he says, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ, they only heard the report, the man who formerly per persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And this is a key verse here. It says, and they praised God because of me. Because of me. And don't you find that amazing that no matter what you've done in your life, that God can use you to bring joy to other people about him. He can do that. There's nothing you've done in your life that can keep you from doing that. Paul was overseeing murders, persecution, putting people in jail, and they were rejoicing because of him. Rejoicing. We serve a good God. Let me read to you just a little bit more scripture, and I'm going to talk to you about a few things, and we'll work so close. Okay, chapter 2, it says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also, I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had been, not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom, and you better know that there's freedom through grace we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Then he says in verse 5, he says, We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. 
And we're going to get back to that sentence right there in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I want to talk to you about three false teachings we need to be aware of. Three false teachings. The first one is works-based faith. It was prevalent in Paul's day. We saw it in chapter 3 how Paul was trying to talk to the people who were falling back into the law. It's still happening now. It's still happening now where people are trying to have to put other uh, things onto the gospel to add to it that we must do to be saved. And I don't know if you'll get this, but I think that's more enticing than we might know. I think it's more enticing than we might know. So let me, let me tell you this. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, and I told them that it is my personality to want to try to earn it, earn something. It is. It's my personality to want to justify myself, my place, my position, whatever, I'm, whatever I've received. I want to do that. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my personality in this little quick story. When I was 18 years old, I was working at Target, and I, yeah, I used to fill their shelves and stuff right out of high school. And I'd walk around with this little gun, and I'd scan stuff, and then I'd go get it from the back. It was an interesting job. Well, I noticed that as I was doing that, that the shelves didn't really get that much more work. They really didn't. I was just scanning outs, and I'd go get them, and, and it was fine. But we had all this stuff in the stock room, and I was like, man, I know that we can sell this stuff if we put it out. And so what I did was, is over the next couple of weeks after I figured this out, I would scan the departments I was in charge of, and then I'd go get the stuff, put it out real fast, and then I would go purge the stock rooms. And I would take everything out of the stock room and try to put it out, and it didn't go out of it. Well, it was, uh, I, our stock manager was on vacation that, during that time, and he comes back, and somebody comes to, get, comes to get him and says, hey, something happened to one of your stock rooms. And that stock manager walks in there, and he looks at it, and like half the stuff is gone. So they start, start trying to figure out what happened to it. And so they figure out that it was this young guy named Matt that was messing with all this stuff. And so they, 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 they call me over the intercom, uh, Matt Johnson, to the stock room. And so I went to the stock room. And, said, and all these managers were there. And I thought I was in trouble. And I, they said, hey, Matt, what happened in here? I, said, I don't know. They said, well, do you know, did you do this? And I was like, yeah. They said, well, where'd you put all this stuff? Put it on the south floor. And they're like, I said, yeah, I just, we just, just put it out there. It goes in the floor. Like, How'd you have time to do that? I said, well, I just hurried. I did my job. And at the end of the day, it's 30 minutes, an hour. I just come back here and work on it. And they're like, okay. And then that stock manager would be, this is amazing. This is great. He, was, he never had anybody actually tried to do something above and beyond. Never. There's people just trying to scan their shelves and go home. But I couldn't stand that because I knew that was my expectation. I always wanted to do more. You know why? It made me feel better about me. It did. It made me feel more valuable. It made me feel more like an asset. It always did. And so let's not fool ourselves. It's real easy to fall into things that fit us. And so it's easy for me to also do that too. To want to do things to make me feel better about me. We just need to be careful. We can't justify us. And the other thing I want you to know about uh, a workspace faith you know what that leads to? It leads to religion. And we don't want religion. We want relationship. We want relationship. A relationship with Jesus. Let's go to the next one. The next one's kind of tricky. Is there are people out there that try to deceive you by talking about Jesus. They'll put pamphlets on your door. They'll, they'll meet you along the pathway and hand you something. And they'll talk about Jesus. Now, I want you to know this because you may not have heard this before. What they will do is, is they will talk about Jesus' life, but they will not talk about his message. They will talk about some of the things that he did, that he was a good man, all those things, because they believe he's a prophet, a good man, but they don't believe he was the son of God. And so they try to get you in by talking about him because they know that many people trust in him. But it's not the same gospel. In fact, it's not even close. And so be leery if somebody's doing that. You need to know. Make sure it lines up with the Word of God. The last one I, I want to give you is kind of, it's hard to talk about. In fact, I'm, I'm not going to talk much about it because I won't do it justice and I want to be fair to it. But uh, it's the prosperity gospel. 
Uh, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm anti-prosperity gospel. And it's not that I don't believe that God wants good things for us, because I do. I believe God wants greater things for you than you can possibly imagine, not for your glory, but for his glory in the name of Jesus. I believe that. And I believe that God blesses us not because we're good, but because he's good. And I believe that he's got great plans for our life. I do. But I'm not going to go as far to want some of those things and put that out here is what I'm looking at, what I'm trying to achieve, especially when it doesn't line up with the Word of God. And so I want to tell you that some of the biggest churches in the United States of America preach the prosperity gospel. That God wants you to be rich. He wants you to have all kinds of things. And I'm not saying He doesn't. But it doesn't ever need to be about that. Because I want to tell you, when I look at the Word of God, and I look at it as a whole. I remember Jesus saying, in this world, you will have trouble. I remember Paul talking about sacrifice. I remember ta him talking about perseverance. I remember him writing letters from prisons. I remember the apostles, almost every one of them died a horrible death, either crucified or got their head cut off. It doesn't sound like they were prospering right here. I believe the greatest riches we'll ever know will not be here, but will be there. And that's okay with me. That's okay with me. And so those are just three. There's others that we need to be aware of and knowledgeable on. And really the biggest thing that we need to know is we need to know what we believe. And I, I didn't plan to say this to you, but this just popped on my head. Let me tell you this real quick. Uh, what, you know what, what I do? I'm, I'm an arborist, and I go around looking at stuff all, all the time and telling people what's wrong with their trees. And... and uh, People ask me all the time about different things and how I learn stuff and uh, what the most important thing is to look at. And I'll tell you the most important thing to know about a tree. The most important thing above all else. And that is when you look at it, what's normal? What's normal? I mean, is it supposed to turn that way? Is it supposed to drop its leaves at this time? Is it supposed to do this or that? If you don't know what normal is, you don't know nothing. So you need to know what normal is for you too. What does this say? If you don't know this, you're going to go anywhere, any direction. You got to know what the Word of God says to be true. With that said, I got one more little thing for you, and we're going to close. I'm going to go back to this scripture. Chapter 2, verse 5. This is a good one. It says, We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you for you I know he's not talking to us right that moment he's talking to them but he's talking to us too you know we stand on the shoulders of the people that were before us the people that kept the gospel alive to pass it on from generation to generation to spread the good news about Jesus you know, there's a young man probably in here somewhere. I'm not sure where he's at, but it's Briar Cordova. And the first time I ever met him was at United, and he was carrying out my groceries. And as we were talking, we got to talking about Jesus. He told me, he said, he would not let his generation be the one to let it die. I'm like, God, I love this kid. I love him. It's a big deal. And not only do we just not want the, the gospel to die, we want to make sure the truth about the gospel remains the truth. And we don't want to get off on all the other tangents. We don't want to let things come in that are personal preference or what we want the gospel to be. We want it to be the gospel that Paul preached. The gospel that God intended for it to be. And so let me just read you one more scripture. Hopefully I can find it because I didn't mark it. It's in Psalm chapter 20. If you want to turn there, you can. It's, it's really short. I can read it to you. And, or I can memorize it, but say it to you, but if I said it to you wrong, you might get me afterwards. Psalm chapter 20, let me tell you this. Uh, I guess it was uh, about six or seven weeks ago, I went to church with uh, Bobby and Vicki Farrington in Plainview. Me and Lisa went, and, and we had a really good service, and at the end of the service, the pastor said one scripture, and I don't, I don't care how much you read this book, there's going to be times where you hear a scripture, it's like, man, I've never heard that before. <laughs> it is amazing. It's an amazing scripture, Psalm 20, verse 7. Remember this one. I'll read it to you. It says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, 
But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Oh, that's good. That is so good. I mean, come on. Let's modernize that just for a second. Some are going to trust in material things. Some are going to trust in other people. Some are going to trust in other things. But no, 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 no. We are to trust in Jesus. In Jesus. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the gospel that we share, the gospel that we teach, the gospel that we're telling our family about, our friends about, is the gospel that God called us to. And I want to just tell you this. This is straight from my heart. I don't care what the world tries to give me. I don't care how shiny it is, how fancy it is. I don't care about none of it. If I don't get Jesus, I got ripped off. And you did too. If you don't get Jesus, you got ripped off. It is meaningless. Don't get distracted from the truth about the Word of God. The gospel about Jesus. There is no imitation. There's only one. And it's about Him. Let's pray. Father, you're so good. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for the opportunity to speak over it. Talk about it, God. Thanks for loving us and giving us a gift that was undeserved. Love you and praise you. Amen.